All right, so I hope I'm audible. So good evening. Uh, I welcome the viewers to this problem solving and live interaction session for the subject strength of materials offered by Professor K. Ramesh on the Swayam portal. So today uh, we will be discussing the last uh, contents of the last week, which has to do with stability and buckling. And also in the uh, uh, in the next week on Thursday, uh, we will be having the session uh, at the same time, 6 to 8 p.m in the evening uh, instead of friday it will be uh, thursday evening and there we will have a comprehensive session where we will be discussing uh, the contents that have spanned throughout the course so if uh, there are any questions from the actual assignments of this course run that uh, viewers or uh, uh, students want me to solve i request you to please raise it in the uh, discussion forum so that i can include them in any case i will be taking representative problems for uh, from each and every week to solve so that the concepts become clear before uh, people take the exam if they are taking so uh, i suppose that is all right so uh, in case somebody is attending this for the first time i'll just briefly introduce myself my name is ganesh ramaswamy i'm a doctoral scholar in the department of applied mechanics and biomedical engineering at iit madras and uh, i'm working under the guidance of professor k ramesh and professor u saravanan so uh, let us get started. Before we begin, are there any questions that uh, that are there that we need to address? I hope I'm clearly audible. So, okay, I take it that uh, things are clear. So, as we go along, should there be any questions, please feel free to ask. So, let us look at this problem. It says, for problems investigating... Uh, hi, uh, welcome. Uh, uh, could you, uh, I mean, do you mind if you, if we can mute your mic? Uh, as and when you have any questions, you may please ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So the question says, for problems investigating stability of the columns, the equilibrium equations have to be written for deformed coordinates, undeformed coordinates, deformed coordinates, either or, or both. So what is this trying to ask basically? So till now, what we saw, we took either a bar that was there, that was in axial tension. So we comfortably wrote the equilibrium equations here. We cut a section here. We took the stress distribution like that and wrote the equilibrium equation and found what the stresses are. Similarly, for bending, if this was the case of bending, we took the supports like that. We let us say that we had some load like that. Although we could understand that it would bend somewhat this way, we did not differentiate between this and the deformed configuration. Why? Because we did not specify whether the loads are still perpendicular to the deformed shape or whether they are straight. In one of the cases, it will be an approximate solution. So we did not worry much about this. Now it so happens that there is another kind of, so, and uh, as we saw in the theories of failure, we have been equating it to the peak stresses of the material so that it doesn't fail, uh, lose its functionality uh, in terms of yielding and so on. So these are all termed, uh, these are all, they can be categorized into structural failure now there is also a problem of stability failure so as the classic example goes if we were to take a cup like that and if you were to place a ball of inside this if you were to disturb this if you were to give it a perturbation it will return to its original shape whereas if i were to take the same case flip it over and if we were to place the ball exactly at the center of that peak, it still is in equilibrium. So this would be, this would be a case of stable equilibrium, where upon the slightest perturbation, it oscillates and gets back to its original position. Whereas this, if we were to somehow manage to just rest it on the tip of that, should it rest, it still is in static equilibrium, but at the slightest perturbation, it will get totally disturbed. 
and if another case if we were to have a flat surface like that and if we were to place this and at the if we were to disturb it so it will just occupy a new position so these are not generally desirable from a structural point of view because we want it to return to its original configuration so that the stresses and the displacement do not peak so if we were to understand this in the context of let us say a member like that which is subjected to a compressive force like this and for the sake of this example let me take that this is connected to a pin there and let this be connected to a roller like that now in general if you were to consider uh, if you were to write the uh, without considering the deformed configuration if you were to write the equilibrium equations here it will give us how the this co this uh, compressive member will deform as we increase the load it will get deformed like that as we increase the load further of course i'm drawing an exaggerated picture it just bulks uh, bulks in the lateral direction and just undergoes direct compression however if we were to see with an example for any any thin member if we were to see a scale such as this we generally note so if you were to see a scale such as this we generally note that if you were to apply a compression it will get it follows some path that is not getting predicted uh, that is not predicted by our present uh, uh, equilibrium equation in this configuration towards this if we were to take our deformed configuration let us say and if we, this were to be the case let us say that this is under a compression t and let us define the axis like that let this be defined as x let this be defined as y of course when we take the cross sectional view let this be the cross section any anything for that matter let that be some cross section like that with the centroid over there with y and z appearing like this now if we were to take this structure and attempt let us say i make a cut here i'll remove the rest i can also remove the actual structure from here let this be the idealized elastic curve of that structure now if i were to uh, say that this is in equilibrium attained equilibrium at some point so to respect that equilibrium what is it that i have to do there will be a force that is equal and opposite applied by the cut other cut portion on this portion similarly let us say this was the center line and let us call this some uh, say delta y let us call this some delta y now we can see that this these are two opposite forces which are separated by distance delta y which means it is part of forming a couple which has to be nullified by development uh, by mobilization of a bending moment so if this were to be uh, clock anti clockwise in nature we can see that our bending moment will mobilize this way for it to uh, maintain its equilibrium state right so in this configuration i can see that mb is nothing but p into let me take the absolute value of delta y i'll tell the reason why i am taking this let us say that instead of this i assume that my deformed shape is actually this way if it were to go to the other end i will still have p this still is delta y only this is positive and 
the other one as we have defined the axis is going downward so that is negative even in this case we can see that these forces are separated by this distance and this creates a couple clockwise couple and to counteract this we will still have a bending moment getting mobilized like that in the opposite nature so if i were to write it this way no matter what i take the bending moment is always in the opposite nature to the couple that is getting mobilized by virtue of giving it that delta y which is what is we are terming as deformed configuration so we are actually writing we are taking portion of we are first idealizing the structure to be deformed this way then we are cutting it taking a section of it we are applying the forces external forces as well as the mobilized internal forces and then we are writing the equilibrium equation in order to arrive at this equation now it is not it is quite easy to see that a deformed uh, member straight member to get deformed like this can still happen if we were to apply a couple like that at the ends and we already have a recipe on how to go about analyzing a bent uh, beam the beams is what we have analyzed so far so if it if it were to flex this way what is it that we know from our flexural formula we know sigma xx by y is minus mb by izz equal to e by i e by r so this is something we know based on our flexural analysis now if i were to take mb from here and also from our moment curvature relationship which we saw is what is used in our double integration method to find out deflections what is it that we saw that ei delta y i'm sorry ei d2 delta y by dx squared is actually equal to the bending moment now this delta y naturally in the lectures it would have been defined as y or v or something what i mean is this is the deflection from the actual original configuration of the beam when it is deflected whatever the distance it has traversed whatever the displacement it has traversed is what i mean by this so this is the curvature which gets equated to the bending moment by multiplying it with our flexural rigidity this is something we have seen so if i were to substitute i already know that my bending moment is that way and this always gets mobilized in the opposite nature so e i i for the time being i am taking it to be i i'll they, uh, we we will discuss as to which i would actually govern so d2 delta y by dx squared will actually be equal to minus p delta y because bending moment is always getting mobilized in the opposite nature to that of the applied force so if i were to simplify this and bring it to the left hand side so we have a second order differential equation and uh, if we were to write it in a different form we can actually recognize what its general solution is so this is of the form m squared or rather d squared y or uh, i should say v double dash plus kv equaling 0 so this is of that form which is a homogeneous second order differential equation for this we have the general solution a general solution meaning if you were to plug that in with some generic constants it would still hold it will actually obey this differential equation so the general form is c1 cos r 
uh, I I'll rewrite this a bit. So I can say d2 delta y by dx squared and call it some k squared delta y equaling 0. It is just a matter of convenience to say this because the solution comes in the form of kx. Now, if I were to put k there, then I have to put root k here, which is why I am avoiding that plus c2 sine kx. This is the general solution for this second order homogeneous differential equation which we have got by writing our equilibrium equation in the deformed configuration. So, now for this configuration that we took, what are the boundary conditions? So, x, the origin, origin of x is here. So, for this curve, if we were to see, we have basically written the equation of this curve, which respects the differential equation because we have written the equilibrium equation by cutting the deformed configuration. I hope that is clear. Now, let us say that this is, this member is of length L. Now, when x is 0, we can see that it is hinged to that point. So, our delta y is actually 0 at the ends, at either ends. So, the boundary conditions for the solution, for this case, become what? At x equaling 0, because we have our equation of y as a function of x and some material parameters. Delta y is actually equal to 0. So, if I were to substitute this here, let me take this again and put it here. So, substituting this delta y equaling 0 at c1 cos k 0 plus c2 sin k 0. Now, sin 0 is 0, cos 0 is 1. So, this gives us C1 equal to 0. So, one of the terms is knocked off. So, what is left? So, delta y becomes C2 sin kx is what we are left with and we have still not plugged in the second boundary condition which is at x equal to L, delta y is 0. So, if I were to plug this in, so this is 0 C2 sin k x uh, sin k l. Now, we have a product of two quantities equaling 0. So, this will happen when this can happen when either one of them is 0. So, if c2 is 0, this is a trivial solution. This is a trivial solution which is just uh, uh, that is just a constant is getting multiplied and we defined that to be 0 and the equation is satisfied. The other solution gives us that sin kl is actually equal to 0. Now, we know from our unit circle I am sorry. Yeah, from our unit circle, we know that sin is 0 at these points, cos is 0 as tho those points and so on. So, sin is 0 at every, if we were to start from here, sin is 0 at 0 and then sin is 0 at pi, pi, then 2 pi. So, at every integer multiple of pi, sin is 0. So, sin kl equaling 0 implies, uh, let me put it here actually, implies that kl is actually equal to some integer multiple of pi. When this happens, the condition gets satisfied and subsequently, we uh, are able to 
actually satisfy the differential equation that we wrote again from equilibrium in the deformed configuration. So this gives us k is n pi by l. But we have defined in here when we were to write the general solution, k we have defined as p by ei. We have actually defined k squared as p by ei. k squared is actually equal to this quantity. So therefore, k is root over p by ei. Now, if I were to bring these two together, this implies that this is equal to this quantity. So from here, if I were to solve for p, it is nothing but n squared pi squared by l squared e i. So what is it that we have got here? We have got some value of the load which can cause a deformation of the form. This will cause deformation of the form delta y equal to c2 sine k we can substitute for k it is this into x now we can see that this is actually captured this actually captures our the observation that we saw with the scale that when we press this, it actually deforms into a curve. And we see that the governing load is given by this. So let us say that we had a perfect column, a perfect compression member, which we will term as columns or struts, so to speak. So if we have a perfect compression member and if we keep on compressing it, in general, it will undergo direct compression like that if it were very stub. Now I can imagine that if I just took a small portion of this or rather if I took a very uh, member that is not slender, that is one dimension is not very long. If I took a very small this thing and if I were to apply compression, then naturally the first uh, uh, response that it would give is to undergo axial compression rather than buckle like that so it happens that as we increase p as the slenderness goes on increasing and as we increase p or uh, if the member were to become very slender or if we were to increase p in such a case there would come a point where it would actually buckle into the shape that we have uh, co conceived and we also saw in the experiment that we just did so as as p increases we see that p critical would reach when n takes some number so what is the first integer that n could take it would be a case where the beam or the column actually deforms like that which happens to be the first harmonic now, if I were to take the same co column, apply that with compression, with the same boundary conditions, let us say, but I were to stiffen it here. Yes, n equal to 1, yeah. If I were to, let us say, I, if I were to stiffen it by some means here, I hope you get the idea. So in this case, if I were to compress this, we will actually be seeing the beam 
go into the second harmonic so it is purely a function of how the boundary conditions are defined so it cannot happen that if i were to have this column like this it cannot happen that it would actually have a node here it will follow the first harmonic so for this case which we have idealized for which we have written the boundary uh, equilibrium equation the deformed configuration n equal to 1 as somebody also remarked will give the actual critical load that causes it to bend in the way we idealized which is termed as buckling so pi squared ei by l squared now in this case if i were to let us say the moment of inertia can be written as a r squared this or rather let me write it in full form the moment of inertia of a section can be written as its area into the radius of gyration so if we were to write this pcr will be e into a r squared by l squared or pcr is pi squared ea by l by r squared and this term is termed as the slenderness ratio so from this equation we can see that pcr is inversely all this is also represented by lambda so we can see yeah sorry this is lambda squared all right so if i were to plot this like that and let me take a here a to the bottom of this so what is it that i have i have critical stress is proportional to 1 by the square of the slenderness ratio so what is this if i were to how do, how will this curve look it will basically look something like that where this is the slenderness ratio and this is the critical stress that is developed now we know that as we increase stress in a material ultimately there will be a point at which it will either yield or break so there is a limit to this so call this the failure stress or the yield let me say so what does this imply so as long as we are in this domain as long as we are in this domain where the slenderness is very less meaning the column is very very stub when we apply our response will be mostly direct compression so this is the region is termed as short or stub columns so here direct compression governs whereas as we go on increasing the slenderness ratio what we see is buckling behavior the so the failure uh, this is actually the region for long columns so if i were to demarcate this into region 1 and 2 in region 1 where the slenderness is very very less meaning l by r ratio is less which means l is comparable to r so when that happens the column is very stuck and when we apply a compression it basically direct compression is what takes it to failure whereas as we go on increasing the slenderness ratio our peak 
our stress that the column undergoes even though it is not reaching the critical stress there will be loss of functionality because of buckling so that is what we term as a stability problem which is what happens in long columns so with this brief if i were to revisit this for investigating stability of the columns rather than the structural failure alone the uh, actual uh, peak stress alone for investigating the stability the equilibrium equations have to be written in the deformed coordinates unlike any other member that we have analyzed so far meaning uh, compression and tension truss members that is bending torsion and so on so for columns for to investigate the stability we necessarily have to write the equilibrium equations in the deformed coordinate so that we are able to relate the force and the actual def uh, 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 deformation brought about by the buckled mode of the columns so i hope that is clear if there are any questions please feel free to ask Yes, yes, please. Sir, uh, actually, what is the slenderness? Slenderness ratio? is we have the length of the we saw L we defined as the length of the member, right? And radius of gyration, as we brought in here, if we were to see this equation. so we have one section let us say let us say this is our this is how our column looks when we cut it and view it so this has a centroid this is y this is z so let this be the geometric centroid uh, geometric center for which you will have some izz let us say it will have a moment of inertia as well as some area so the ratio of the moment of inertia to the area is termed as the radius of gyration this is basically a measure of how far it is distributed with respect to the actual uh, uh, centroid so if this is not too far it implies that it is a uh, it implies r is less now these two are geometric parameters of the actual column one is the length one is dealing with the cross section now the ratio of these two we define it for convenience as one ratio a metric just like weight uh, uh, there are many metrics that we define uh, stress displacement so on we define one ratio as the slenderness ratio which characterizes how slender that column is meaning how long it is compared to its lateral dimensions if we take a square and call this the length we know this is also l so when i take the ratio of these two it is comparable so this is not slender whereas if i were to take a very uh, if i were to take a beam like this where the length and let us say the depth is d so l is much much greater than d this is quite slender so i have to devise uh, i have to actually define a metric in order to measure this which is what is the measure slenderness ratio it is a geometric measure of how slender the column is that is how uh, skewed the aspect ratio is of the highest dimension and the least dimension so to speak is it clear sir are there any follow up questions i hope uh, okay clear thank you okay, okay sir clear sir all right okay so we basically saw the equation of this form this was the general equation that we saw and then we applied the boundary conditions these boundary conditions we applied subsequently but the general solution <coughs> still remains the same now if i were to instead take one to be fixed and the other to be hinged and so on so based on different boundary conditions i will actually get different values of the harmonics which actually uh, i i will not delve much into that because it is a very standard thing that can be found in any book also it is provided in the lecture my idea was to uh, impress upon the fact that we are actually writing the 
uh, equilibrium equations in the deformed coordinate system rather than the uh, original configuration as opposed to what we have been doing. So once that we have defined this, it so happens that we can actually relate. So what we have got presently, and this was actually first derived by Euler. So Euler's buckling load is defined as n squared pi squared ei by l squared for which the first harmonic becomes when n equal to 1 we have pcr as pi squared ei by l squared now here we have actually taken l to be the entire length of the of the column uh, granted i have column i have drawn the column horizontally generally when we see in books it will be drawn vertically but uh, it doesn't matter how it is oriented the basic uh, understanding that we should have is it is undergoing compression it is buckling so no matter how it is oriented in space if it were to under uh, actually if it is undergoing compression and is buckling this way we deem that as a column as opposed to other uh, structural members such as beams and uh, truss members and so on so if instead if i were to fix this so what would my buckle shape look like here naturally there is no rotation allowed so whatever theta i have here would actually be have to nullify it because of by virtue of that being a fixed end so my deformed configuration will be something like that let us say i were to fix it here as well if i fix both ends and if i were to apply compression then naturally my column will not take any load because i i have idealized that to be fixed and the fixed end will take all the load by meaning it will not move so in that uh, in the context of column fixing the ends of a column it doesn't mean that it is actually fixed for fixed towards compression it only means that rotation is fixed the uh, rotation is arrested the actual compression is still allowed so if i were to place the same thing let us say like that so this becomes a guided roller where i it actually allows rotation as well as translation so it is one in the same however if i were to uh, as it is there in one of the example problems that we will see later if i were to embed that into something like this let us say it is embedded into something like that which in itself is over a guided roller in this case translation is still there but the rotation will not is still arrested so the actual shape deformed shape would start like that in, as opposed to starting like this with a non zero slope so i suppose uh, you are able to appreciate that so this is what we termed as fixed pinned and so on so for these different boundary conditions it can actually be related to this p critical which turns out to be some ratio so that ratio we actually account for in the length of the column so which you can refer the lecture for that so therefore if both ends or rather let me write that there if both ends were fixed our effective length effective meaning what participates in the actual buckling if i have this fixed only some portion of the length participates in buckling so only if i were to confine my attention only to that portion 
and deem that to be L, I can actually uh, derive the equations in the form that we want, which means that it is some ratio of the actual L, which is effective, effective in the buckling phenomenon, which is why we deem that, we term that as effective length, which happens to be half of the actual length of the column. Now, when both the end, ends are hinged, we just solve that, that the effective length has full participation of the length of the column. When one end is fixed and the other end is free, if it were something like that and gets deformed like that, so the actual length that is participating can actually be looked at or rather uh, I'll have to draw it again, can be looked at as, so this becomes the total sine wave in such a case. So in that case, the effective length becomes twice the actual length of the member. So for the third case, which is this, the effective length is actually 2L. And when one is hinged and the other is fixed, as we saw, if this were fixed like that, and we have a hinge here. So in this case, our length that participates happened to be about 70% of the length. So therefore, for this case, L effective is actually 0.7L. So with this background, if I were to see substitute and C for PCR, for the pinned case, happens to be so this is for case 1 let us say happens to be pi square ei by l square because l effective is or let me write l effective squared which is l squared for both ends hinged uh, for, for both ends fixed what we have is PCR2 is actually pi squared EI by half of L. So that will actually be 0.5L squared. So for fixed free, PCR, let us call it case 3, will be pi squared EI by 2L squared and for fixed pinned. So these are the general supports that we can conceive of, either it is fixed, either rotation is allowed either it is uh, either nothing is constrained that is it is free so in this case we will see that it is pi square ei by i'll say 0.7l squared so if we were to simplify this and see which one would offer the maximum resistance what do we mean by maximum resistance we these are the critical buckling load beyond which it will actually start buckling so we do not in order for us to avoid buckling failure we have to have a condition where this happens to be maximum so which is the denominator which is least so we can clearly see that when 0.5 when we take uh, a fixed fixed column it will actually be able to sustain the maximum amount of load so both ends fixed would actually give us the offer the maximum resistance against buckling. So I hope that is clear.
so with that background let us solve some numericals now okay so with that background let us try to see this question find out the correct expression for the load p as it is applied here for which the rod ab as shown in the figure starts to buckle let l be the length of this rod and ei be its flexural rigidity both ends are both ends on, of this rod are hinged is what is given so we know for a hinged hinge condition l effective is nothing but l very well so we have the force like this so one component of the force will be along the member and one will be across or perpendicular to the member and we know that the one along the member is what is responsible for the buckling phenomena so therefore force along the rod ab is nothing but p cos 30 degrees so from our euler buckling theory we can see that p critical is actually equal to pi squared ei by l effective squared substituting this we get p cos 30 is actually equal to this quantity except we can drop the l effective squared because it, that is equal to l squared since it's a hinge tinge condition so therefore from here it follows that p is pi squared ei by l squared divided by cos 30 which is root 3 by 2 so when the force reaches this assume under the assumption of no imperfections the rod will actually buckle at this force when p is equal to 2 pi squared ei by root 3 l squared which is our option c yeah yes please go ahead sir can i ask doubt sir actually what you say both the yeah. fixed and both in hinged what do you mean i actually okay uh let us say that there is a member like this now if i were to if this deforms like that so at this end i have a rotation right and if i were to let us say compress it like this let the point be over here or uh, let me let me go about uh, explaining it this way let us say that this is the actual length of the member and i apply a compression with this and its deformation is like that where this has come over here so now this has not only translated this has also rotated right the deformed the column has translated as well as the end of the column is translated as well as rotated so when both these are allowed both these are allowed only in the case where it is pinned so you know what a pin support is a uh, hinge support or a pin support uh, vertically force only develops okay uh, all right that is uh, one way to look at it uh, there are three types of supports so one is a hinge which allows which arrests translation that is it will hold it it will not allow it to translate but allows rotation see in a plane in the plane of this screen this square can actually translate anywhere as well as rotate these are the only two degrees of freedom it has actually speaking in this plane it has three degrees of freedom why because it can translate along x it can translate along y and it can rotate about z 
so in the plane of this sheet this square has 3 degrees of freedom three movements that are possible any movement that it undergoes can be decomposed into translation uh, in this direction translation in that direction and rotation in this direction so when all the three are arrested it is a fixed support a support that arrests all the three is called a fixed support a support that arrests only the translation but allows rotation is called a hinged support and a roller is where it will arrest translation only in one direction it will allow translation in the other direction so let us say that i had this square like this and if it was not allowed to translate like this or like that or rotate like this it is actually supported by a fixed support this point whereas if it if it was not allowed to translate but only rotate at that same point about that same point it is connected to a hinge support if it is allowed to translate in this direction but not in this direction and still allowed to rotate it is connected to a roller which for the sake of this discussion is again pinned in that case so is that clear i don't know if i have answered your question clear okay fine clear sir okay so as we saw in this case so let me just put this aside yeah so consider a steel column of length 4 meters so we have the length is 4 meters as shown in the figure both the ends of the column can be considered as fixed here we see if let us say this was also fixed like this so we have in the generic sense of the term fixed if we had fixed it like this totally similar to this then it would actually undergo no deformation at all because the entire load will be taken by the support itself what i mean to say is if the column was actually like this and if i were to load it at either ends actually the fixed as per our definition will not allow it to take any load at all so this is actually not a structural member at all so this is not we are what we are talking about presently we are talking about the bottom being fixed for translation as well as rotation and the top if i were to see this actually goes into this block which arrests its rotation but it is still allowed to translate in this direction i hope that is clear so if i were to draw the deformed shape deformed buckle shape of this column it will be something like this where essentially only half the length particip participates so that is why we term uh, we actually uh, derive l effective to be half of the actual length so since it is both ends fixed we will have l effective equal to l by 2 which is 2 meters in this case the cross sectional dimensions are also given in the figure which is 100 mm by it's a square cross section meaning when we cut it and see it like this we will actually see a square 100 by 100 determine the p load p in kilonewton for which the column starts to buckle so as we increase p let us say that we started out applying a very less load so the conjecture is that initially the column would undergo compression like this of course i am drawing an exaggerated figure at some point in time when p crosses the critical load then two solutions are possible not only the compression but it can also buckle and buckling load is what we are instability is what we are looking at presently so as we reach some in a perfect column in a perfectly straight column without any imperfections where as we increase the load at some point in time it actually reaches a p critical where 
the second solution that is the buckled shape solution also becomes viable so we are we actually want the load when it starts to buckle which means we actually want p critical so we know that pcr is actually pi squared ei by l effective squared so let us go about calculating that so for this case critical is pi squared what is e this material is made of steel which has a young's modulus of 200 gpa so this is 200 e3 in mpa into what is i now this begs the question let this be y let this be z for this section we have two moments of inertia ixx and iyy and izz that is uh, it can be either about the y axis or it can be about the z axis so this begs the question which is the i that i am actually supposed to take let us say izz is greater than iyy so as we can see here when p increases from 0 to p critical we actually reach the buckling load so it is easy to see that the minimum the least moment of inertia is the moment of inertia that will actually govern the buckling behavior meaning if i have to let us say that i take a sec cross section like this it will buckle in along this direction and not along this direction because the least moment of inertia is about this axis is about this axis so it will always buckle in this direction i hope that is clear is there any doubt in this are there any questions about this okay i okay i take it it is clear so no sir i or the moment of inertia governing buckling is invariably the least moment of inertia of the section in our question it so happens that it's a square section so even if we were to calculate icc or iyy it doesn't make any difference so then again there is one question one may ask then in which direction will it buckle so this is only a conjecture that we are making that it's a perfect column so it can buckle in either of the directions but naturally in actual uh, in reality when we apply p we will not be applying exactly through the centroid of the section there will be some eccentricity also we are considering this column to be perfectly straight which also will not happen when we actually construct it so the actual buckling in which direction it will happen will be governed by such small imperfections uh, but uh, presently we are not looking at them that will come as a purview of the higher level courses and so on so i is 100 into 100 cube by 12 for a square i have written so ei by l effective squared l effective we saw is 2 meters so converting that into millimeter squared so therefore pcr is equal to into pi squared into 203 into 100 into 100 cube by 12 so this is and the question is asking in kilonewton so our answer is in newton so we'll just multiply it by 10 power minus 3 in order for us to get 4112.36 kilonewton so what does this mean that as according to our conjecture presently how we have idealized this taking this to be a perfect straight column and uh, assuming that the load that we have applied is exactly through the centroid as we increase the load from zero 
and uh, approach this value our buckling behavior will start governing the failure rather than direct compression so from a trust member uh, that is uh, from an actual direct compression member it will start uh, I, deforming into this shape so i hope that is clear all right so let us look at this question if the diameter of a long column is decreased by 20% the resulting percentage reduction in the euler's critical buckling load is what so what this asks let us say that for the original case column section let d be the dia let d be the diameter so therefore pcr for the original is given by pi squared e by l effective squared into i now what is i for a circular section it is pi d power 4 by 64 so this is case 1 now we have been told that this d has been has decreased by 20 percent so therefore for the reduced reduced case it will be pi square d by l effective squared into pi so 0.8 d power 4 by 64 so this is what it will come to because it has decreased by 20 percent it has decreased by 20 percent so it will be 80 percent of what it was so let us call this second now what we have been asked what is the percentage reduction in Euler's buckling load is original let me take both of this here so this is original minus the reduced one divided by original because that is what with respect to what we are taking divided by this so what will this come to if i were to take i can actually cancel these things out So from here this I can cancel out 64 and pi also I can cancel out so it just leaves me with this quantity which we can easily calculate which is 1 minus 0.8 squared by 1 into 100 of course the, so the percentage reduction is coming out to be 100 is that So the percentage reduction is 36 percent so i hope that is clear so if you were to look at this question yeah sir uh, previous some uh, how you write 0 0.8 ah, power 4 it's not required how i how i wrote this 
quantity is what you are asking is it in the question it says it is decreased by 20% yeah yes sir yes. so if it was initially 100 now it is 80 so it is just 0.8 times of that 1 1 minus 20 100 minus okay, 20 by 100 So this is actually power four. So this will actually be fifty nine percent instead of thirty six. I hope that is clear. So if we were to look at this question, the column of rectangular cross section as shown in the figure has a length of five meter. So here the we have not been shown the column. What we have been told. Is this the cross section of the column, where one dimension is 400 and the other is 200? And in the plane, in the direction out of the plane of the paper, the column has a length of 5 meters. So L is 5 meters. One end on the column is considered fixed, and the other end is free. so we saw that when one end is fixed and the other end is free we have l effective for fixed free as 2l so therefore l effective is nothing but 10 meter so so far so good this much we know now the young's modulus of steel of which the column is made is 210 so e is given so the moment of inertia of the column in 10 power 6 mm power 4 governing buckling behavior is what is what is asked so if i were to take this section and let us say this is y And this is Z. So I Z Z is given by 200 into 400 cube by 12, which is 1066.7 into 10 power 6 mm power 4 similarly iyy is 400 into 200 cube by 12 which is 266. 67 into 10 power 6 mm power 4 now it is easy to see that buckling would be governed by i y y because that is the least i hope that is clear why that is so pcr is pi squared e i by l effective squared so what we are trying to say here is if one moment of inertia is let us say 266 and the other is 1066 so what is the ratio of both it is about four times so what we are saying is one if one is pcr the other will be four times of pcr as we increase the load from zero naturally pcr is what we will reach first instead of four pcr which is why the minimum least moment of inertia governs the buckling behavior so the moment of inertia actually governing buckling behavior is this which is 266.67 and since the answer already has 10 power 6 i'll remove this so this is our answer here so far so good so we have actually calculated the moment of inertia now the question asks what is the critical buckling load in mega newton so we know that pcr is pi squared ei 
by L effective squared, which is pi squared into 210 GPA into this quantity divided by we know what is L effective it is 10 meters so it is 10 E3 squared so which gives us PCR as five point five two into ten power six Newton or the critical load is five point five two mega Newton. So this quantity is what we have calculated here as 5.52 mega Newton. Determine the slenderness ratio of this column. So whatever measure uh, we had defined to actually see whether this is a long column or a short column, where it falls. So the slenderness ratio for this column is actually L effective by R where R is radius of gyration which is root over I by A I minimum by A because minimum is what is governing the uh, behavior. So therefore, if I were to calculate this, R is what is the minimum moment of inertia? It is 266 into 10 power 6. This divided by what is the area of this section? It is 200 by 400 mm. So this is 200 by 400. So R comes out to be divided by 200 into 400. So this is 3375 mm. So therefore, slenderness ratio is L effective by R, which is 10 meters by this quantity. Oh, uh, please note one thing that I missed here is the root over. So this will actually be the square root of that quantity. Yes, any questions? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I missed the square root. Thank you for pointing it out. Yeah, yeah. So because the slenderness ratio came out to be 3. So that is why I was wondering how can it be such a thick column when it is so long and the section is like that. So what is our slenderness ratio finally? It is 173.20. There are no units because it is a ratio of two similar quantities. So this is our slenderness ratio for this problem. All right. So far, so good. So let us look at now presently all the sections that we have seen. We have only seen 
that is one cross section is there and that is what is acting as a column however if we were to see transmission towers and uh, many other columns that we see across bridge supports and so on they are actually made up of multiple sections which are tied together using some bracing so actually one member could be some angle or a c section which will be put in one configuration and these will be tied together by plates and that is how we will actually see the columns to be as we see in our transmission towers and so on so these are actually called built up columns which are made of individual uh, standard sections tied together using bracings so a built up column is proposed to be made of four equal steel angles so we have one angle that is available with us at site and we intend to make a built up column with this configuration that is four four angles are placed with a distance of 50 mm in the y direction and 75 mm in the z direction and the, there will be bracings here along the height of the column but those have not been shown here for uh, clarity so these are this is made of steel and the section of one uh, the cross section of one steel column is like this where the one side length is 50 mm and since this is an equal section this is also 50 and the thickness of the sheet the steel uh, the, this thing is 6 mm is arranged to support a compressive load the angles would be braced appropriately along its length length in this context is out of the plane of the paper that is height of the column so it is arranged and is maintained that all the sections uh, and uh, maintains all the sections along its length according to the following questions accordingly answer the following questions based on the given data so the moment of inertia of this column in 10 par 6 same question which governs the buckling behavior so we don't need to actually calculate the moment of inertia to conclude which is the moment of inertia of this column that will govern so we have this as y direction this as z direction so the moment of inertia about y that is i y y we'll see what will it be so we have one section like this uh one minute my screen seems to be stuck yeah so we have one section like this which has a centroid over here centroid over here so this angle will actually have some moment of inertia about its centroid and then we will be using parallel axis theorem where the total i will be i of that of this steel section about its centroid plus area into this distance squared similarly for i z z we will be taking this distance as r so rest everything remains the same because these are four identical angle sections which are in one direction these are separated by 75 mm in the other direction it is separated by 50 mm so naturally r from its centroid here will be less so for this question from visual inspection alone one can see that i z z is less than i y y and would govern buckling so now all we need to do is find out what that izz is so first let us deal with one angle and then we will see how to go about uh, calculating the moment of inertia of the total section so let this be that one angle here so what is this distance this is 50 mm or rather what i I'll, i'll do is let me take it till there so this distance comes out to be 
50 total is 50 minus 6 that is 44 mm and let this be the centroid let c be centroid of this equal angle so how will we find let us say this is this distance is some y1 let us say so how will we find out y1 y1 is summation of a y by summation of a about about this line so let this be a a so a y about a a so therefore y1 for this rectangular uh, section wa, uh, how will we write it it will be 44 what is the area it is 44 into 6 into what is the distance of its centroid about actually this will be y bar so 44 by 2 plus 6 plus for the for this section it will be 50 into 6 into 6 by 2 whole divided by what is the total area it is 50 plus 44 into 6 there are some uh, made of two rectangles one is smaller than the other so this is what y1 is which will come out to be let me calculate this 44 into 6 into 22 plus 6 plus 50 into 6 into 6 squared by 2 divided by 15 to 6 plus 44 to 6 so this comes out to be 14.702 mm so what this means is let the section be like that so this distance to the centroid of the section this is 14.7 mm when the total uh, actual uh, depth is 50 mm so therefore moment of inertia of one angle about its centroid c is let this be termed i self let this be i z z self let us define it like this so let us calculate i c z self it will be nothing but about this point i have to take moment of inertia of this section and moment of inertia of this section and add it up so that we know the recipe about this zone centroid then we have to apply parallel axis theorem a r squared which which is something we have to repeatedly do in this question that is all there is to it so i x x self is nothing but 44 or rather 6 into 44 cubed by 12 plus 6 into 44 into 44 by 2 plus 6 minus 14.702 the whole squared what have i done this is the moment of inertia about its own one of the arms about its own centroid a r squared plus 50 into 6 cubed 
by 12. For this section, it will be B D cubed by 12 plus this distance. What is the distance of C from its centroid? It is 14.7 minus half of the thickness that is 6 by 2. So plus 50 into 6 into 14.702 minus 6 by 2 squared. So let us calculate what this comes out to be. 6 into 42 cubed by 12 plus 6 into 44 into 22 plus 6 minus 14.702 squared plus 15 to 6 cubed by 12 plus 15 to 6 into 3 squared. So this comes out to be 131.257 or 26 into 10 power 3 mm power 4. So this is IZZ self as we have defined it for one section. I'll just quickly check the calculations once again so that we are not making any mistakes. Yeah, so we have got IXX self that is for one of these arms about its own centroid we have found out what the moment of inertia is. Now about the global for this arrangement which has four of these members what is the moment of inertia about a uh, moment of inertia of that entire angle about this point in the in this direction now it will be IXX self plus area of this into that centroid to this. This distance will be r. So it will be a r squared. So how will we calculate r? From this end, we know that c is 14.702. And from this end, this point is half of 50, which is 25. So our r is actually 25 plus 14.702. It is easy to see. And that is for one of the angles we can see it will be the same for all the angles and since this is in the negative direction but still when we multiply we actually do a r squared it doesn't matter it simply adds up negative uh, square of a negative quantity is again positive so if i were to write the moment of inertia of one section about this this axis and then multiplied by 4 i will get the actual moment of inertia of this entire built up column about zz about the z axis so let us go ahead and do that therefore for the built up column izz is 4 4 because there are 4 columns into IZZ self plus area into delta Y squared. This delta Y is what I was terming as R. In any case, we terminology doesn't matter. So let us go ahead and substitute this. So IZZ is 4 times. into this quantity plus area of a single angle is 50 into 6 plus 44 into 6 so i will take 6 common so 15 to 44 into 6 into dy dy is nothing but 14. 702 plus 
50 by 2. So this is my IZZ total. So let us go ahead and calculate this. So IZZ for the built up column. Or let me term it as IZZ total. Is nothing but 131.26 into 10 power 3 plus 50 plus 44 into 6 into plus 25 the whole square. Into 4. So this comes out to be 4.08 into 10 power 6 mm power 4. So this is the actual moment of inertia that will govern the buckling behavior of that column arrangement where there are four angles separated by a distance of 50 mm along the y direction. So far so good. So we have actually found out what the moment of inertia is. Rest is simple substitution into the formula which we will do quickly. So this is my IZZ, the moment of inertia of the column governing buckling behavior. So the next question asks, consider the column has a support, uh, uh, the consider the column has to support a load of, safe load of 50 kN. So it should not exceed the maximum load that is getting applied to the column is 50 kN. Report the maximum permissible length such that it is free of buckling, that is it is safe against buckling. That is what this safe means. It is safe against buckling. So what is it, what is it that this question is asking us to do? So PCR we know is pi squared EI by L effective squared. Now we have been told that the critical buckling load is 50 kN pi squared E and this is steel. In the question, it is given to be steel where it is 210 GPA. So this is 210 E3 into IYY, IZZ, which is 4.08 into 10 power 6 divided by L effective squared. So from here, we can calculate, therefore, L effective is nothing but this quantity divided by this root over so this is what L effective is so let us go ahead and calculate L effective, which is 50 E3 uh, reciprocal to pi squared into 210 E3 into 4.08 into 10 power 6 root over. So L effective comes out to be 13.13004.82 mm or other way to put it is L effective is 13 meters. So what this question says is, if we had a column of this arrangement which had the moment of inertia to be 4.08 into 10 power 6 by arranging that way and if it were to be subjected to a maximum load, safe load against buckling, if it has to have a safe load against buckling of a minimum 50 kN, then it would have to have an effective length of 13 meters alone. If it exceeds this length, then it becomes more slender, then it will be prone to buckling. Whereas if we maintain our length as at 13 or less, we will be within the safe limits is what this question tells us. And this is the participating effective length. It is not the actual length of the column yet. Actual length of the column is a is related to the effective length 
based on its boundary condition that we saw. So let us look at what this question says. Considering that the column has to support a safe load of 50 kN, report the maximum permissible length of the column in meter for the following end conditions. So when one end of this column is fixed and the other end is free, we know for this case, we know that L effective is two times of the actual length of the column. So therefore, L is L effective by 2, which is 13 by 2, which is 6.5 meters. So when the support condition is this way, for our constraints to be respected, the length of the column cannot, the physical length of the column cannot exceed 6.5 meters. Similarly, for pinned pinned, we know that L effective is actually equal to L, which is 13 meters. Yeah, which is 13 meters. So, uh, when we have pinned ends on bo bo both the, the uh, when we have pins on both the ends of the column, then the actual length that can safely support that load can be 13 meters. When it is fixed and pinned, so for this combination, we know that L effective is 0.7 times of L or L is L effective by 0 0.7, which is 13 by 0 0.7, which happens to be 18.57 meters. So we can see that it ranges from 6.5 meters. We can actually go three times its length if we actually modify the boundary condition to be fixed at one end. And rather than having it free at the other, if we were to pin it at the other end, we can actually have three times the length and still support the same load. Now it were to be fixed, fixed, we know that L effective is 0.5 L. So therefore, L is two times of 13, which is 26 meters. So we can see that given a maximum load, the column can actually be the longest if it were fixed at both the ends. The other way to say it is, if we when we fix the column at both the ends, that is uh, arrest the rotation, at both the ends, only half of the length participates into the buckling phenomena and uh, we can actually maximize its actual length given a safe load. So I hope that is clear uh, on how we solve this problem. So basically what we saw is we have had an angle section, but that was not sufficient. So we had to go for some built up column as given in the question. So we arranged the uh, uh, angle section in one particular way which was braced and which are separated by some physical distance. So what we went about doing is we calculated the moment of inertia of one of the angle sections about its own centroid. Then for the global system for the arrangement we calculated the governing moment of inertia that governs the buckling behavior. From there given the maximum critical load we were actually we, uh, we were actually able to find out what L effective was. And depending on the end conditions from L effective, we could actually back calculate the actual physical length of the column that is permissible for this column to operate under safe conditions. So I hope uh, that is clear. So anyway, I have uh, run out of questions now. It's uh, we still have time. So in case there are any other questions that you have or something that you want me to explain, I can do that. You're most welcome to ask. So please go ahead in case you have any questions. Is it clear what we discussed today? Are there any questions based on that? Uh, no, okay, it is clear, fine. Okay, anything from the, yeah. No, sir. Okay, that is also clear. Anything from the previous assignment questions okay. that you want me to clarify? Is everything going well with the assignments? Are there any doubts on that front?
sir actually in previous assignment problem sir yeah we will get in pdf sir okay sir oh we will actually, get the assignment problem so we just we found Actually, uh, I want sir that uh, uh, assignment problem solution. Solution. See, actually, uh, what we have been directed is in order to engage the students more. What we encourage is in whichever question you got stuck or whichever question you got wrong, we encourage the students to okay. actually mail their handwritten solution, okay. and we will correct it, and we will. Okay. Uh, give you what the problems are okay, in case sir. there were. I any. want to mail it in. Mail it. It's yes, mail. yes. Please mail it. You know, in the Swayam portal, there is one uh, uh, ask a question. One discussion forum is there. You can simply go there, ask, okay. uh, initiate the discussion, and mail your answers. And we will correct that, and we'll tell you what the problem okay. is. Really. Because uh, that way, the users, okay. uh, students, are more engaged. All right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, then uh, perhaps we can call it a day because I have uh, uh, nothing more to add to the discussion today. Uh, the next week on 17th, that is coming Thursday, from 6 to 8, we will be having one session that will span uh, over the contents of the entire course. And I'll be selecting some selected questions from the uh, assignments to solve live. Sir, and yes. yes, please. Sir, yeah, go ahead. Actually, in a previous problem, yeah, uh, we calculated a length, no, sir, length. Yes. Different length. Uh, yes. Fixed end, free end. Exactly. Fixed, fixed. Yeah. Thinner, thinner. Yeah. Sir, a different length we got. Yes. But actually, in that uh, different length means uh, material yeah. saving also it will uh, consider, no, sir. What is a uh, one length we got thirteen meters. Yes. One length we got uh, 26 meters. Yeah. Which one is uh, uh, load wise? Which one is good? Means uh, fixed fixed or uh, fixed free or pin it pin. So there is one interesting question about which column is which choice of the support is actually better for this question? Whether it is fixed free, pin pin, fixed pinned or the fixed fixed option? Because granted, once the load is fixed, we have actually calculated different lengths that are catering to that load. So to the un to answer this, let us go back to our previous discussion that we had on stress versus the slenderness ratio. If we see here, on one side we have a given stress, the critical stress, which has an inverse relationship with the slenderness ratio. If I were to have a cap on this stress value, it will directly have an inverse relationship on my slenderness ratio, meaning for a column that has to take more load, I actually have to limit its height. So any support condition that actually allows me to go for a greater height for the same stress levels is basically a success of that design. So to answer that, in respect of our columns, if we see in the last question, we have actually capped the load that the column should be able to have a safe load of 50 kN. With this constraint and given some cross section, we have a critical stress that develops. Now with that critical stress, respecting that constraint, whichever boundary condition actually gives, allows me to go for the highest column would be the best option, meaning that will have the maximum slenderness ratio. So that would be the actual success of that design. So in that respect, if I were to have a fixed fixed column, I can see that only half of that length is actually participating in the buckling phenomena, which is allowing me to, for the same stress, it is allowing me to go for a longer column, which is a design requirement. Whereas if I were to constrain it to have only a fixed free condition, I can only go 6.5 meters. So if my design requires me to go 26 meters, I have to use bracings. However, in this case, there is no need for me to use mid uh, height bracings. I can directly go for one column which has the fixed fixed condition at both ends and uh, actually scale that entire height. Okay, so I hope that is clear. So if there are any further questions, uh, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, we can call it a day and uh, we'll meet uh, next uh,
Thursday for one comprehensive session on the entire course as a review before the exam. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending. So I'll see you next week. Thanks.